a truly a, a, an remarkable, everlasting presence in American and American Irish poetry. Um, one of the last of the survivor generation of the great dominant poets that included Richard Ryan and Hugh Maxton and poets like that. Um, a, a truly uh, legendary poet, Thomas Dylan Redshaw, um, who's, who came to our attention when we were very, very young because he was in pursuit of meaning in the poetry of John Montague. Uh, and he did his, eventually did his doctorate on Montague at New York University under Harold Bloom. Um, so his depth of understanding in, of Irish history, Irish culture and atavisms and um, contradictions and untruthfulness and truthfulness and the sort of various lives of poetic generations within the Irish world. He knows all of these things, and all of these things impinge upon the atmosphere and themes of his own poetry. I wouldn't say that it's only from the Irish world that he has mastered the mastery of memory and memoir and energy, which is so powerful in his work. But I think it is also a tribute to his own Red Shaw, New England Puritan ancestors. The precision in his work and its delicacy and, and the finish of his phrasing and the deliberateness of his craft work is something I think that is almost like a Puritan culture. But on top of that, or beneath that, is the great kind of dancing mischief of the Dillons, which he has also inherited and runs in his blood. So here is a marvellous poet of the American world and how it's been coloured by Irish memories. Thomas Dillon Mitchell. Cracked, 
your dog crushed and are bedded, shredded across raking fields. And then there's a poem that is, is, has Kit Cornell's name in it, and it states a kind of ideal that we hope will contain that truth of experience. Cut by Kit Cornell. I did not buy the real thing at the market on Hospital Hill that last summer morning but took away a perfect postcard of it, a bookmark, a memento, as if the glaze gave a scene we will travel into but not return from, a gray and sandy foreshore, darker where the tide laps back, and where we will remain gazing at the blue gleam, lightly turning across darker waters to the lip of the cup, lit up like a line of low clouds lying easterly on a horizon. Out there, the cup waits, empty and ever ready to fill, raise and pass hand to hand. And when we share a poem at night, in the middle of the night, to our family, to an audience, we are really passing that cup. Part of the work of Mortal was to get, uh, was to record my beginning sensation of mortality, which was brought home in many, many different ways, and you can see it in the book. But several, uh, several poems in here about my father carry over into my, my newer work. And I want to give you a poem titled, it was the first of these that I was pleased with, called My Father's Feet. He props himself up at the edge of his painted bed, arms angled out, holding the mattress's edge. I have lotion and a towel on the floor beside me. He has a lot to say about the strain of bending unsteadily to clip his nails, care for his feet on his own. Kneeling in front of him, I rub the lotion between my palms and take one white foot at a time, ankle to toes, easing the tendons, then palm each heel, each narrow sole, again and again, letting him catch the lotion scent of rosemary. On the bed's grained headboard, in faded gold and black, someone once stenciled a dim theorem of a cornucopia spilling out apples, melons, grapes, this is the least I can do. And then in the new poems, I try to encounter, and the new poems are going to be called The House of Sleep. I try to encounter the stories that I was told about my father's passing and the fact that I wasn't told the truth. Finally, I, I got a hold of it and I wrote it down. This is called At Last. The retired nurse calls her back into his room that looks into thin aspens and oaks of a marsh. She goes in past the girl from the hospice, and he asks her to come lie beside him in his bed, not shy at all, courting like a kid, his pajama top open where the pacemaker lies under the flesh at his collarbone and makes an outline like a pack of lucky strikes in a shirt pocket. They lie together a little while side by side, not lonesome at all. 
as if they were dancing away back in the 40s to the small band at the General Edwards Inn. He asked her for a kiss. After, he pulls himself up, slides his legs over the edge of the mattress, pauses, looks out, and slips slow to the floor, gone in a foxtrot through the quivering leaves. I um, cared for my mother in her 90s. She lived into her 100th year. Um, uh, we had shared a home together, and we got to know each other very differently. I actually enjoyed knowing my parents when they were in their 70s and 80s and 90s. Uh, virtually 75 years of my life has been fixed into history by them, by having them alive as the uh, World Book Encyclopedias of Emotional Lore. <laughs> this is a part about when I began to understand that my mother was soon to pass away. It's a poem called Fett, and I'd like to say thank Jerry Smith for being so kind as to select it for the Irish Times this week. Theft. In the morning, I asked myself when it began. When did your going come near? When did the certainty of it come clear? The theft, I think. She was in the door before me and saw drawers open, cupboard doors hanging wide. Her desk open. Uh, he had skills. All right. He had patience. No one saw him come and go. He found all her books and mine a disappointment. But he was a pro and no carny with the stay fair. Nothing vandalized except memory. Her red jewel box empty on the bed. Her mother's gold beads gone. The, five, the gold five ruble coin. Her thin wedding band. Days later, a deep down voice on the phone asked for her by name, hung up. At breakfast, she looked up from her English muffins, muffin, looked away off into that August light and confessed to no one, I am not really here. Now, I'm not a human, and many lovers of formal poetry are not useful anymore. Sometimes meetings like this remind me of the, the last meeting of the Unitarian Universalist Society for the Arrangement of Child Care, uh, meaning us. This is called geriatric. Not a stripling staggered by his father's expiration. <clears throat> at a counter of the Oyster Bar in the Grand Central. Not a competent 50-year-old silent at his mother's bedside in the cancer ward a day's drive from home. Not the silent listener to an officer's formulaic call, their twisted car at rest amid freeway poppies. The plight of these mid-century novels yielded to her sense of a country life kith and kin, hearth and bedstead, long since perished, except as an austere ideal that framed me in willing care. Retired, slowing, sensible, and holding my breath, early in my seventies, trying to nourish, offering near her aunt a broth she could hardly taste, discovering that I was almost too old to do it. My mother had a fall down the stairs either caused by a stroke or the 
This trouble was caused by the fall down the stairs. It doesn't matter which. It was a sudden thing, and it meant that her passage from this world, which was a struggle for her, happened over Easter. It happened during the time from Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday. And I never got over that. And I remember thinking on Good Friday Eve, which happened also to be Passover last year, that I have to try to understand this rather than just register it. So I was upstairs looking out the window, and suddenly we had a soft spring snowfall. I stand before the window in the hall upstairs. Her one granddaughter has gone home. Her house is quiet. Downstairs, my brother and his wife talk slowly. An hour has gone since her small meal. The hospice nurse smooths her blanket, goes to the green sofa, takes out her good book. It is Good Friday. I listen for steady breathing. I look out and away, and in that, in that quiet, snow has begun. Small flakes, slowly, steadily, sweet. Feathers of grace descend in the land. Old trees arch their arms up into the dark. Ever whiter, ever softer, the roadway leads off from here. Not a trace, not a step. Later, after her death, I still live in her house, so the oddest particular things turn around and uh, cause the griefs to come again. <laughs> This one is called Washing Up. It was a came during one of our Minnesota blizzards. We had six of them this year. Uh, washing Up. The shutter wraps on the shingle. A loose storm whispers, whistles. I look up from the sink and out into the dark, into gusts of snow. Now that nine months have passed, for a moment I am back upstairs, listening in again, looking out at that quiet, slow pass of the snow, asking yet again that ancient question, the one without answer. The storm window whispers, moans. The one about passing over, about letting wind go so that the heart comes to a stop, goes to awaiting the instant wanting release, awaiting that instant when flesh goes to clay, soil under snow. A gasp of white in the window's light. I want to know that it was release she wanted, to believe what she wanted was ever for our sakes when she rolled over saying, straight on, don't cry, I'll get through this. Sprinkled throughout these books are uh, poems based on Bible illustrations that occur in her Confirmation Bible. It was a Methodist Bible, and there were bad sort of 19 teens illustrations of biblical scene, totally wrong historically and archaeologically, but nonetheless, that they were. Um, and reading around in it, uh, I come to various scenes that I've made more abstract. This is a, a poem called Nicodemus, and he's a figure for me. Neighbors on a dusty alley complained of the night visitor. He came in a cloak wrapped inside out to hide his badges of office. 
He came to stand in one corner, in one brick archway or the other. He came to pause long before the long, wrong door, the closed one. He came to listen the way a new moon lights a clay sill. He came to look in and stand back so only his sandals happened to show. He stood near the feast table, <coughs> bearing the bread and herbs, salt and wine. He stood just beyond the yellow glow of the oil lamps. A day and a year later, he came to bring bought and spices for the cloth others provided. <clears throat> and next to last poem is called Valentine. And it came to me when I was in the parking lot of my not very good local supermarket. It's called Cub Foods. And all those, all their vegetables often look as though they've been run over by a truck. <laughs> So I just come out and I sat down behind the car and yet again I was singing. A Valentine. He knew he would be a basket case, but so unhinged as this, so unwoven, but not this now. Not poor Tom's climb up the moor in gusts of sleep to the darkful edge. Absurd behind the wheel in an icy parking lot warmed by his new car, a black wagon, a German even. At his age, it is ridiculous and selfly to act the lorn child in the starry attic. 75, 75 years on from his too soon birth in the August of a war, or just now, alone in the house she left, to rise a sudden from a creaking chair and stand raveled gawking over the edge. Sunshine after a, after a snow fog shower finds him out, a tremble, red-eyed, and pleading into cold air in a vacant doorway. I haven't learned that poem well enough. I have to practice it more. My very last poem for you, uh, amidst all the storm and drama and drama, it's a very simple one called Lighthouse. In the end of the evening, I go from room to room, switching on a lamp in each for light through the night. At the start of the morning, I go from room to room, switching off a lamp in each for light through the day. Thank you.